Well, good morning, Godfess Fours. It's great to be together again this morning. Whether you are online, whether you are in person, whether you're joining us from around the world, we just want to say you are so welcome. Uh, thanks for being part uh, of our gathering together. And we're going to worship together right now. We're going to hand over to our band as we sing songs to God. We're going to sing songs about God. We're going to declare His goodness together as we rejoice in who he is and what he has done. Let's worship together. Good morning, church. It is amazing to be together. And uh, let's remember this morning, we have a God who is here, who's full of grace, full of mercy. So we're here to sing, to worship him. Let's sing, Diza Kadumisa. We're going to worship God because of grace. Diza Kadumisa. Diza Kadumisa. Diza Kadumisa. O Jesus, o homem sem desceu a Diz a que tu me sa Diz a que tu me sa Diz a que tu me sa Go ba o long ele into our hearts, Jesus. We want to give you our minds, our voices, even our bodies, our tired morning bodies, as we worship you. We let our praise be your welcome. Amazing, we can welcome in the living God this morning. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. We open our hearts to you. Our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem. Your renown fill the sky. Your word come in power. 
that was dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To your hearts, to you our hearts are open. Nothing here is here. You are one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy, God. To fire for down. To our hearts are open. Say again. To you our hearts are open. Nothing is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy, God. To fire for Let your fire fall down Fall on us, Lord We're thirsty We're hungry for you this morning, Lord We welcome you We welcome you with praise We welcome you with praise Almighty God of love Be welcomed in this place We welcome you with praise Welcome you with praise, Almighty God of love. We welcome you. We welcome. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, Almighty God of love. We welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, Almighty God of love. We welcome in this let every heart. Heart adore, let every soul away. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. To our hearts, to you our hearts are open. Nothing here is in you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. Let your fire fall down To you our hearts are open Nothing is hidden You are one design Only you are holy You alone are worthy God, let your fire fall down Come and fall on us, Lord. We're hungry for you. Let's just wait on him for a moment. Wherever you are, just open up your heart. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. I'm going to sing this new song, but I think you've heard it before, from a few weeks ago. All things are possible When we believe All chains are breakable When we receive Cause Yahweh You keep your promises If you said it We believe it If you said it If you said it we believe it If you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of your word. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of your word. All things, all things are possible. When we believe, all 
old chains are breakable when we receive this Yahweh you keep your promises if you said it we believe it if you said it if you said it we believe it if you said it we believe it it's your amount of your word if you said it we If you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of this, we're confident. We have this confidence. You finish what you started. God, you have never failed. You won't stop with me. Present in every step. Patient in every heartache. God, you have never failed. Start with me If you said it, we believe it If you said it, we believe it You're a man of your word If you said it, we believe it If you said it, we believe it Jesus, he said some amazing things. We want to remember your promises this morning. Michelle is just going to read out a couple of the amazing promises that he made, whoever hears you. So these are for us today. John 5, 24. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. I will not be judged, but has over, it's crossed over from death to life. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. Oh man, we're never gonna go hungry. We've crossed from death to life. Jesus, you're our savior. Let's sing. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of your word. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, we believe it. Cause you're a man of your life. Let's say if we have this confidence. We have this confidence. You finish what you started. God, you have never failed. You won't stop with me. You're present in every step. You're patient in every heartache. God, you have never failed. Start with me. If you said it, we believe it. Father, we're so grateful that we get to worship you. Whether it be in our homes, whether it be in our workplaces, whether it be in person and churches, we're grateful that we can come and be in your presence. Thank you for being amongst us this morning. Amen. Well, can you believe we're now well into November and thoughts are turning to Christmas? It may well be a very different year for us this year, um, but we're busy uh, planning for what our Christmas may, may look like. And the first thing that we want to talk about this morning is our upcoming Christmas appeal for Vic Coppen School. As you know, we work hard into Vic Coppen Primary School. Uh, Cliff and his team are working particularly in helping young, uh, young children who are struggling with lit reading and with literacy. And so as part of that, there's 96 children in grades one, two, and three that Cliff invests in every week, trying to catch them up with some of their literacy work. And we want to bless them as we go uh, into Christmas. We want to bless them by giving them a rucksack, we want to fill it with stationery for next year. We want to put some really good books uh, into their hands and into their homes. And being Christmas, we want to give them a toy. And so what we're going to be doing on the next two Sundays is we're going to be having our Christmas wrap. The way it works is you come along uh, in person to church. 
you give your you give your 100 rand um, uh, that's going to be matched by DC Coffee, who are also going to be putting in 100 rand per child, um, and that will buy a full pack. You get to wrap it up, leave a little message. And not only that, each one of these children are currently making a small thank you gift for you. So you'll get their name, you'll get that gift, you can put the gift um, up somewhere at home, and it can remind you throughout this month to be praying for that child and for their family. What a great way of partnering with Vit Coppin at primary school. We're also partnering with Vit Coppin Clinic. It's right next door and World AIDS Day is coming up and we're looking forward to getting involved um, in Bury Rolls. Uh, serving Bury Rolls to the entire uh, patients and staff on the 1st of December. It's a Tuesday because of World AIDS Day. They have an HIV clinic there and so we want to bless that entire clinic. What we're going to do is going to pitch up at 9 o'clock. We're going to go through till about uh, 12, 1 o'clock and we're going to be serving uh, Bury Rolls to everyone. How can you get involved? Uh, well, if you're online and you're not in person, you can contribute to both the Vit Cop and School Appeal or to the Bury Roll Appeal just by uh, just by depositing your your hundred bucks or your donation uh, into our uh, bank account. Uh, just make sure you reference what it is you're giving to. Alternatively, why don't you get involved in person? You can find out how by connecting with us at info info at g14ways.co. Za. We're also planning our Christmas services. What will they look like? Well, 6th of December is going to be our annual carol service. We'll be doing that over two services at 9 a.m. and at 5 p.m. You're going to need to book online. We'll be running a children's program at both of those services. So please do make sure you book online for that. The bookings for that are only going to open a week before, but do put that date in your diary. We're going to be exclusively online from the following Sunday, the 13th of December, um, except for Christmas Day. Christmas Day is a great opportunity for us to be together uh, and to celebrate. We won't have a kids program. They'll be in the service with us. Numbers will be limited. And again, we'll give details of how you can book. But if you're in Joburg on the 25th of December, uh, why not come along and enjoy a little bit of Christmas Day uh, with your wider church family? that will be great. Thanks so much. If you are considering coming back to church, you, you've got some concerns, you know, do, do feel free to give us a ring. And a quick reminder, if you are booking, you do need to book online. And the earlier you book in the week, the more that helps us administratively. So lots and lots to look forward to, uh, including today's preach. We're going to hand over to Ryan now. He's in part two of our series, Rooted, taken from 1 Peter chapter 1. And so Ryan, it's over to you. Take us away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen, and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Ryan. I am one of the pastors here at God First, and we are continuing in our Rooted series. And today I want to talk about what's the big idea with the Bible? What is the Bible all about? And uh, the Bible is one of the most loved and one of the most hated books ever written. In some countries, it's actually legal to own a Bible. It's, uh, it's considered so dangerous that you're not allowed to, to own a copy of the Bible, and yet in countries like China, the Bible still finds its way in. The church is still growing. There's approximately 80 million Christians in China, if you include the underground church. That's almost the same amount of people in the Communist Party's membership. Even in countries like, in continents like Europe, where uh, at best the Bible is considered to be kind of neutral, there's a neutral attitude towards the Bible, the Bible remains a bestseller year in, year out, year after year, approximately 44 million copies of the Bible get sold every year. And so if the Bible was included in bestseller lists, nothing else would get a look in on the top because the Bible would be a bestseller year in, year out, every year. And so the Bible continues to carry massive influence across time across the globe. It continues to be a book that lots of people want to read. Shakespeare was translated into 60 languages across the globe. Harry Potter was translated into 67 languages across the globe. Go figure. The Bible has been translated into 2,233 languages across the globe. It continues, whether you love it, whether you hate it, it continues to be a very influential book a book that st it stood the test of time, a book that somehow has transcended cultures, people groups, nations, and it's very significant. So whether we love or hate the Bible, it is a significant book. And yet, and yet 
many of us have big questions about the reliability of the Bible and big questions about what it's all about. I remember doing a talk like this where I ended up speaking on the Bible and an older gentleman came to me afterwards who had been a Christian for many years. And he said he found the talk so helpful. He had had very big questions about the Bible and some of them got answered. And we started meeting together, just looking at this big topic and answering some of his objections to the Bible. And at the end of it, his faith really grew because he said that because his view of the Bible had, there were so many questions, uh, his faith suffered as a result of it. He hadn't had the confidence to share about his faith because his perspective on the Bible was, uh, was, was changed. And, um, and I know that for many of us, we can have big questions about the Bible, whether, whether we're not Christians, whether we're just um, checking things out, or whether we've been walking with Jesus and tracking with Him for a long time. We can have big questions about the Bible. So I want to ask three questions about the Bible from 1 Peter chapter 1. Just three verses. I'm going to ask three questions from this passage of Scripture. Let's read together 1 Peter chapter 1. From verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. So the first big question that is often asked is, is the Bible a human construct? Isn't it just a, a construct that comes from human beings, um, a human invention? Aren't the Bible reflecting um, human ideas written by men who, um, who have had ideas about God? And so essentially, don't we just have a man-made religion? And Peter's answer to this question is, yes, it is written by human beings, but it's architected by God. It's architected by God. Have a look again, verse 10. Concerning the salvation, the prophets... The, the human beings, the, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them, the great architect, the ultimate architect, the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. And so the authors of the Bible are human beings. Yes, the prophets, the human beings, they wrote the Bible. But, but at the same time, it was the Spirit of Christ in them, pointing them, moving them, guiding them, directing them to write certain things about God. Consider, for as an example, um, there was an architect, a South African architect in the year 2000, Jeremy Rose, who designed the Hector Peterson Museum. It was Jeremy Rose who thought up the ideas. It was Jeremy Rose who, who planned it. It was Jeremy Rose's mind. It was Jeremy Rose's ideas. It was Jeremy Rose's plans that he wrote down as the chief architect on the Hector Peter Muse Museum. But then in 2002, when the museum was finally built and opened up, we could see Jeremy Rose's ideas. We could see his designs. We could see his plans. But Jeremy Rose didn't lay a single brick. Jeremy Rose didn't build the walls. Jeremy Rose didn't put the roof on the museum. Jeremy Rose didn't uh, mix the cement. Jeremy Rose didn't put in the electricity. No, no, no. There were construction companies and human laborers that built the actual physical building. And it's like that with the Bible. The architect, the one who pointed them, was the Holy Spirit in them. They were being driven along by the Spirit of God so that their ideas, their thinking, their thoughts reflects the ideas, thinking, and thoughts and designs of God Himself. The Holy Spirit is the architect and they are human laborers. Many human people who are writing, but they are carried along by the Holy Spirit. And these authors are all different people coming from different contexts. And so they write in slightly different ways. But, but ultimately there's a unity and there's a power to the message because it comes from God, the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Bible's written uh, across a time period of 1,500 years. 
by approximately 40 different authors, and that spans three continents. And these authors come from different backgrounds. Some of them were kings, some of them were priests, some of them were statesmen, some of them were farmers and poets, historians. There was even a, a doctor amongst them. And they wrote in different ways, they had different writing styles, and they wrote different genres. We find poetry, we find history, we find narrative, we find prophecy. And so, and so there's all these different personalities, but they are being carried along. They're being moved by the Holy Spirit, the chief architect and so what we have here is not a human construct we've got the ideas of God the design of God coming through in the word of God that's why the Bible is God's word to us about so many different things about how to do relationships it's about romance it's about sex it's about politics it's about um, how to parent it's about how to deal with conflict how to deal with discouragement it's about policy macroeconomics it's about leadership how to how to live in in this life in this very confusing life it's god's word to us about how to do life and the bible is, 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 is a form of, of instruction to us about how to manage the complexity of our day-to-day -day lives. When I first started reading the Bible, I didn't read the Bible to preach. I read the Bible because God had rescued and saved me. My life had seemed from the outside like it was okay, but, but in retrospect, I know I was headed for disaster. And I started to read the Bible to find a new way of, of, of living. I, I wanted to dig new foundations, a new way of doing relationships. I had to learn a new way of dealing with conflict. Amen. Come on, somebody. Because for the truth is, for many of us, if it wasn't for the Bible, we would still be dealing with conflict using our fists. If it wasn't for the Bible, perhaps we wouldn't, we wouldn't be married today. The, the Bible provides a new way of doing things. That's what it was in my own life, a new paradigm, a, a new way of thinking about, about relationships, about money, about, about life, about family, about parenting. The Bible is the thing that has, if I'm honest with you, has saved and rescued the way that I relate to people. Uh, there's a verse that says in the Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to a man. That, that's, that was my own life. There was a way that seemed right to me, but in the end it leads to death. And that's true for many of us. If it wasn't for the Bible, we would be doing business in a very different way. Isn't that true? If it wasn't for the Bible, we would relate to people in a very different way. But the Bible has given us a new paradigm, a new way of relating, a new foundation in preparation for this talk. I asked some friends on Facebook uh, what difference the Bible has made in their lives. One person, Rochelle, said this, For me, the Bible has become a history story about the family I now it am eternally a part of. And there is so much to learn about God's ways and His heart in there. It takes me deeper into a relationship with the Father and helps remind me of the things I so easily forget. Another person, Corsi, said, I see myself in so many of the characters. Every time I read it, it reads me and speaks into my life. I may read a verse over and over, but it means different things every time. There is no book like it, she says. There is wisdom and truth in the Bible that exists in no other book I have read. It's too real to be a lie. It's prophesied over and testified of my life in every season. Jason said this, once I realized and understood how crazy John 3.16 is, and you know John 3.16 well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that who would ever believe in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. He says, once I realized and understood how crazy John 3.16 is, that's what really changed my relationship with Jesus. And so the Bible is more than a human construct. I can vouch in my own life how the Bible has rescued so much, um, so much diff ways of relating to people, ways of parent, ways of dealing with conflict, and it's really been a foundation to me and, and, and to these people. The Bible describes itself as nourishment for the soul. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it's milk that nourishes. It's a light and a lamp for your path in Psalm 119. It's rain and snow that makes you grow in Isaiah. It's, it's an imperishable seed, a seed that's planted into our souls, into our heart, and then bursts into new life. We have received an imperishable seed through the living and abiding Word of God, 1 Peter verse 23. The Bible is a fire that refines us. It refines us, and it's described as a, as a sword for the many 
battles that we face in life. A spiritual sword that protects us, a spiritual sword that we can use in the, in, in the fights that we face in life. It's not only a sword for the fights out there, it's a, sometimes a sword for the fights that are raging inside my own heart. It's, it's alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to penetrate joints and marrow. The, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart, the writer to the Hebrew says. Sometimes there's things raging on in my own heart, and the Bible, the Word of God, can come and bring clarity into my own heart and pierce my own heart. It's useful for teaching, correcting, and rebuking, Timothy uh, chapter, chapter 3, and it's able to give us wisdom. It's, 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 it's a good book. <laughs> if you're looking for a good book, the Word of God is a powerful book. It's more than a human construct, but we need to use it. So I know there's a lot of things in the Bible that I don't personally always understand. There's so much that's complicated, but it's often the things that are simple that I do understand that I struggle most with. We need to, we need to base our lives on the Word of God. That's where the power is. When, when we read it, when we, when we ingest it, when we digest it, hey, listen, there's no, there's no good being served an amazing plate of food and then just kind of looking at it. No, I need, to, I need to enjoy the food. I need to eat the food. It's no good being given a sword, but it's, you know, it's just in the sheath the whole time. No, I need to unsheath the sword, and I need to yeah, learn how to use the sword in, in battle. That's what the Bible is like. It's dynamite, but it needs to be lit. It needs to be used, and then it can become the powerful Word of God in our lives. It's like having a fire in the middle of winter and, 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 not, and not lighting it, not, you know, not, not warming yourself with a fire. We actually need to light the fire in order to enjoy the Word of God's benefits in our lives. How's that going in your life? Are you, are you relying on the foundation? Are you building on the foundation of God's Word and using the sword, using the fire, eating the food? Gandhi, who, who wasn't a Christian, had this to say about the way Christians relate to the Bible. He said, you look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet, but you treat it as though it were nothing more than a piece of literature. Come on, I don't want that to be true of my life. I want to light the dynamite. I want to eat the food. I want to use the sword. I want to build on the powerful word of God. It's changed my life. Every time I've read it, every time I, I sit down with the Bible, it feels like God himself speaks to me. It's, it's written by human beings, but it's more than a human construction. It's the Spirit of God that carried them along to provide God's Word to us. So number one, the Bible is God's Word written by human beings. Question number two, how can I trust the Bible? A question that I've personally asked, a question that I know I've heard lots of people ask. How do you trust the Bible? How do you trust that it's true? How do you trust that it's reliable? And that and that answer is given to us by Peter who says basically that the Old Testament, the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament prophecies predicted Jesus and everything that he did. It predicted like the details of his life, like where he would be born, how he would be born and uh, how he would live, what family he would be born into and, and also how he would die, like details about how he would die, like he would get beaten and he would die on a tree and, and, and then it predicted details about his, his kingdom that would come, the program for renewal. It predicted all of these things. And Peter's essentially saying, because the, the Old Testament, because they didn't have the New Testament at that point, but because the Hebrew Scriptures predicted all of these things and these things came true, you should believe the Scriptures. The Scriptures are trustworthy. It's, it's reliable. Uh, let's have a listen again. Verse 10. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah. He's saying essentially that the Old Testament Scriptures, the Hebrew Bible that they would have had at this time, is reliable because everything that the prophets had said had come true. They, they had witnessed that they were eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, of his death. They were eyewitnesses of all of these things that had been written down a long time ago. And now they had come true. This, when, when you predict something and you are correct about it repeatedly, about detailed things, he's saying, hey, listen, you should take that seriously. The opposite is true for us. Many of us know that when somebody makes a prediction, let's say, for example, we have won the election and, and the votes haven't been counted and they end up being incorrect, 
we don't trust somebody like that. We go, oh no, th that person has made a prediction they, th that, that wasn't true, that wasn't reliable, and so we end up not trusting. But when somebody makes repeated predictions about, about detailed information and they are correct about it, then, then we ought to consider whether they are truly trustworthy. There are hundreds of Old Testament prophecies prefiguring Christ's arrival, the way that he would be born, the place, the time, how he would be born, which family he would be born into, how he would live, how he would die, and his program of renewal. And they were all true. And Peter's saying, hey, listen, you should trust the Bible because it's true. You can build your life on this. What it says is true. And if you obey it, if you build on this, it's going to produce fruit in your own life. For example, one of the prophecies, I'll just give you one, Psalm 22. It starts off with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cries out these words on the cross. And this whole psalm makes sense in light of the cross. He's on the cross forsaken so that you and I would never be. And he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then there are like detailed lines in the psalm that describe what happened at the cross. They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments, verse 18. That's literally what happened at the cross. So the psalm that gets written hundreds of years before the cross is fulfilled at the cross. The Roman soldiers gambled for his clothes. They stripped him naked. They put him on the cross and started gambling for his clothes. That, that verse was fulfilled in the cross. And then verse 7 of Psalm 22, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Verse 7. So the psalmist predicts with great accuracy and great detail what would happen at the cross. And it comes true. And Peter's saying, hey, listen, you should take this seriously. The Bible is true. You can build your life on it. You can believe what it says. And, and the, the, the reality is that there have been other predictions that have been made about, about the Bible itself. Voltaire, the French philosopher, said this, 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible on earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. He said that there would be no more Bibles. Christianity is dead. There would be no more Bibles in 50 years. 50 years after saying this, Voltaire was dead. And the very place that he penned these words, the house that he penned these words in, was being used as a, a printing press to make Bibles. The, the Bible Society ended up using it as a printing press to make Bibles. The Bible is still a significant book. The Bible still sells 44 million copies every year, year after year. It's still a bestseller. Voltaire was wrong, but the Bible's predictions have all come true. The Bible's predictions about Jesus, about who he is, about how you can trust him and what you can build your life on comes true. When you build on God's word, it's, it's faithful. When, when we trust God's word, it's, proved, it's proven to be faithful. It's proven to be faithful in my own life. It's proven to be faithful in many other people's lives. Jesus said, the person, the wise person, the, the, the wise builder, builds on the, on the word of God. And then when the waves come and, and, the, and, and, and when the storms come, and the storms come quickly. We, I love Job. I love how the storms just appear so quickly. You never know when a storm is going to hit during summer. All of a sudden, there are clouds and there's a massive storm and it comes. Jesus said, when the storms of life come, and we don't know when they're going to come, if you've built on God's foundation, on God's word, if you have obeyed it, if you listen to it, if you ingest, if you digest, if you're using it, if you're going, yeah, yeah, it says it like this, and so I'm going to live this way. When the storm comes, you've built on a rock. I want to build on the solid foundation, on the solid rock of God's truth. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. But Jesus says, the person who hears these words of mine and doesn't build on it is like the foolish man who builds on, a, on sand. And when the storms of life come, there's a great crash. Number one, the Bible is written by human beings, but it's God's word to us. He's the architect. Number two, the Bible is reliable. The Holy Spirit led men and women to bring God's word to us, and it was been proven to be true. And then thirdly, isn't the Bible just a very old rule book? Isn't the Bible just a very old rule book? One of the comments that came on my Facebook survey was this one by a friend named Rudo. Rudo said, I had a conversation with someone who couldn't believe that words written 2,000 plus years ago could be at all relevant for modern life. Their concerns was not necessarily about reliability of translations, but more about relevancy. Relevancy. 
And it's possible to read the Bible this way. It's possible to see the Bible as a rule book that was written in an ancient culture. And because that culture is no longer here, the Bible is therefore obsolete. The, the rules that applied in that culture are no longer the rules that we live by today. And it's possible to read the Bible as a rule book. But Peter is saying to us, that's not how the Bible wants to be read. That's not how you ought to read the Bible. It's not essentially a rule book. The Bible is essentially a book about salvation. It's essentially a, a, a book. If you summarize it down, it's a book about the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a book about salvation. Let's read it again from verse 10. Concerning this salvation. Concerning this salvation. That's, what this, that's the big idea. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you. And then verse 11, predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It's a book about salvation. That's the big story of the Bible. It's about, it's about salvation, and salvation is how you become a Christian. But I think because many people think that becoming a Christian is following a bunch of rules, we equate salvation with rules, we equate the Bible with rules, and so we say stuff like this, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? I think to me it means going to church. And while it is right and we ought to go to church, the Bible says, hey, don't give up meeting together. That's what it actually says, you should go to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. Uh, it's for some other people I've spoken to, I've asked the question, what, like, what does it mean to be a Christian? They say, well, I do good things. I do good deeds. And I'm sure God's going to be okay because I've done a lot of good in my life. The problem with that is that, and we, and we know this to be true, right? Most, most human beings think more highly of themselves than is actually accurate. That's actually realistic. We think we actually are a lot better than what we really are. For example, when was the last time? that you witnessed a fender bender, you witnessed two cars colliding, and then the drivers jumping out of the car, rushing towards each other to apologize profusely. When, when was the last time you saw that? Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It was my fault. I'm terribly sorry. I was driving really slowly. I'm from Cape Town. You know Cape Townians drive really safely. I mean, I mean slowly. And, uh, and, and, and the other person goes, no, 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 it was my fault. It was really, I, I, I'm, I'm to blame. I was driving fast. I was, I'm, you know, I'm from Joburg. We drive fast over here. It was my fault. Let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya together. No, 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 that never happens. I have never witnessed people rushing out of their cars from a fender bender to apologize profusely. That just doesn't happen. Why? Because it's, it's easier to think of ourselves as being good and to see the faults in other people. We, we generally think of ourselves more highly than what's accurate. The verdict of the Bible about human nature, all of us, me, all of us, is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In, in fact, the Bible says that if you've broken one commandment, one of the Ten Commandments, let's take, for example, you shall not lie. Have you lied? <laughs> I have. I've broken. The Bible says if you've broken one, it's like breaking all because it's an indicator that we just do not have the ability to measure up to God's standards. We don't have the ability to live holy, perfect lives like God expects of us. And so if, if salvation, if being a Christian is not following a bunch of rules, if it's not doing, doing good deeds, then what is it? Well, four things from the passage. Number one, it's about a person. It's about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Number two, it's about his suffering and the grace that is provided for us. Number three, it's about his glory, his, his resurrection, and his plan for renewal, his kingdom. And then lastly, it requires a choice. So firstly, it's about a person, Jesus Christ. Concerning the salvation, verse 10 says, and then it jumps the, the prophets who spoke of the grace, verse 11, Christ was pointing, um, Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah. So, so the prophets wrote about the salvation, and the salvation was rooted in a person, the Messiah. It's all about the Messiah. The, Bible, the Old Testament points forward to the Messiah. The New Testament looks back at the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a story, and you probably know it well, in Luke 24, where Jesus is, uh, is, is on his way to Emmaus. He's been crucified and he's been resurrected. And he appears to some disciples who are walking with him on, on their way to Emmaus. They've come from Jerusalem. They've just witnessed the crucifixion. And, and Jesus appears to them. They don't recognize him, but Jesus appears to them. And then Jesus says to them, hey, listen, what's going on? What's happened? And they say to Jesus, 
hey, listen, dude, are you like the only one that's from out of town? Are you not from around here? Do you not know? Have you, you heard about Jesus? He's, he was a powerful in, in word and deed. We thought he was going to redeem Israel, but he is dead. He is very dead. We witnessed him being crucified. He died in Jerusalem. They'd come from Jerusalem. They saw him dead. And, and so, you know, he's not the, he's not the one who's going to redeem Israel. And then Jesus says to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken, everything that was predicted, how foolish you are. The whole, the prophets all point to Jesus. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, beginning with the first five books, beginning at the very beginning, Moses and all the prophets, and he works his way through to Jeremiah and Isaiah. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus is walking with these guys, and he opens up the word of God. He opens up the Bible, beginning with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the way through to Isaiah and Jeremiah, and he shows them what the Hebrew scriptures is all about. He says to them, the Hebrew scriptures are all about me. Jesus starts to preach Jesus from the Old Testament scriptures. All of it is pointing towards him. He opens up Leviticus and he starts preaching about himself. He opens up Isaiah, he starts preaching, saying this is what the Bible said about, about Jesus. It all points to Jesus. How so? The question is, how, how, how is that the case? Well, Jesus is like the greater King David. King David, you remember, was the one who slayed Goliath the giant. Jesus slayed the giant of sin and death. To set us free. Jesus is like the greater Moses. Moses led the people out of, out of Egypt in an exodus. Jesus is leading an exodus 2.0. Because the reality is there are still people who are enslaved. There are still people who need freedom. There are still people who are in bondage. And Jesus is leading a great exodus even now that, that we can be a part of. And Jesus is the greater Moses. The, the, the heroes of the Old Testament, they point to the great hero. Jesus is the greater Jonah. Jonah, you remember, reluctantly went to the Ninevites to preach repentance to, to the Ninevites. Jesus didn't leave heaven reluctantly. No, he gave his life willingly because, because of passion and love for you, for me. He left heaven, came to earth, came to preach repentance. And Jesus didn't get stuck in the belly of a, of a fish for three days because of disobedience. No, no, Jesus ended up going to the cross, dying in my place for my sins, being in the grave for three days because of obedience, and then he rose again. Hallelujah. He's alive forevermore. Jesus is the great hero of heroes. How does Jesus fulfill Leviticus? I, we go to Leviticus. We go to the laws. How does Jesus fulfill? How does that point to Jesus? Well, Jesus is the only one who lived out the moral laws. All of us, me, you, we all fall short of the commands of Jesus. Jesus is the only one who lives a beautiful, holy, magnificent, perfect life. The life that, that I failed to live. And then with this magnificent life, he lays it all down. And he fulfills all the ceremonial laws. You remember the ceremonial laws about the priest? Jesus is the high priest. He's the high priest who, who comes into the presence of God and brings us into the presence of God. Jesus is the, 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 the sacrificial lamb. The one who has been slain, his blood slain for us. Our blood is not slain, his blood is slain. He, Jesus is the scapegoat that removes the sin and shame from us. And, and Jesus is, is, is now establishing a kingdom and the church is a kingdom outpost. And he is bringing a new era, a new way of living, a new way of doing life. And he is showing the world what the world could be like if he is king. He's, he's showing us the heart and the principles of those, of those Old Testament social laws. And so he's doing that even now. It all points to Jesus, even the very history of Israel, the history of, of trying to obey God's covenant, but then failing and then exile and failing and then only one tribe obeys, but then even that tribe fails. The, and by the time we get to the New Testament, the New Testament says the true Israel is Jesus. He's the only one that's faithful to God's covenant. It all points to him. Jesus is the hero of the Bible. He is the hero of the Old Testament. He's the hero of the New Testament. Is he the hero of your life? Is he, the, he wants to be your hero. Is, is he the hero? Salvation is knowing Jesus, not knowing arguments. John says he's the living argument. He's life. He, you can know him. He wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship 
with you. To, to, to be a Christian, to be saved, is to know Jesus as your hero. Then secondly, salvation is about a message of suffering and grace. Have a look again concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you. Verse 11, predicted the suffering of the Messiah. Jesus suffered for us. He suffered. He died on the cross for our sins to give us grace. We, we, we sinned. We, we did wrong. We rebelled against. All of our sins are different, but we all sinned. And Jesus died in our place for our sins to, to, to make us sons and daughters of the living God. We enter into a new relationship with God by grace. It's because of what He's done for us. It's a message of grace. And then thirdly, it's a message about glory. The salvation is a message about glory. Jesus is no longer dead. He's alive. And He's reigning and ruling right now. And He's got a kingdom that's being established. And it's pushing back the forces of evil in the world. And He's using Christians. He's using the church. He wants to use you. When you say yes to Jesus, you automatically get enlisted into his kingdom. He's got an adventure for your life. When you say yes to Jesus, you discover the reason you were born, the purpose for your existence. He's got a, a purpose for your life. And that's, that's part of the salvation message. Salvation is not just, you know, a fire insurance policy to go to heaven. You, ooh, I, escaped, I escaped the flames. I'm going straight to heaven. It's not, it's not a pie in the sky when you die. No, no, it's steak on the plate while you wait, right? It's, 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 it's about being saved, yes, but not being saved like being the frozen chosen and then you're just saved and happy and I can't wait to go to heaven. No, 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 no. He's, I'm saved and I'm sent. He's got a plan for your life. He's got an adventure for your life. Salvation requires, lastly, faith. It requires a response. It, it, it demands a choice. It demands a choice. Peter puts it like this in verse 12. Even angels long to look into these things. Even angels long to look. The perfect angels, they don't need anything. They've got everything. The perfect angels are excited about looking into the message of salvation. They, they long to look into salvation. They long to look. This is what excites them. This is what interests them. Peter's saying, it, it should excite you. It, should, it, it demands some sort of response from you. Do, 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 have you responded to the message of salvation? Peter's saying, hey, listen, you need to put your faith in Christ. You, need to put, you can't be on the fence about salvation. You need to make a choice. You need to make a choice and believe in Jesus if you've not yet done so. And then you need to keep making a choice to live by faith. You need to keep making a choice to be wowed by what God is doing, to be wowed by His grace towards us, to be wowed by His plans and to live out His adventure for our lives. But, but it starts with making that first choice. If you've not yet made that first choice, Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. That was my own life. Headed for destruction. Wide is that gate. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Hey, listen, there are two gates. There are two roads. You need to make a choice. You need to, only one of them leads to life. Only one of them leads to life. You need to make a decision. God doesn't make that decision for you. He's given you the wonderful gift of free will. You need to decide, I want to put my faith in Jesus. And, and I urge you to do that even as you watch this. If you feel faith growing and, just, and, just, and your heart beating a little bit faster, and you say, man, yeah, I, I think I can trust the Bible. I think I can trust the message of the Bible, salvation. Put your faith in Jesus. Receive His forgiveness. Follow Him as Lord. He's got a great adventure for your life. If you have already put your faith in Jesus, hey, listen, some of us start really with a lot of exuberance we start in a very excited way. we've got a lot of passion and faith but sometimes with time we just we start to compromise we we see things in the bible we just don't take it too seriously we don't allow the bible and its message to transform us peter said even angels long to look into these things is that is that true for you is this what is this what gets your attention in terms of the way that your schedule looks do you give your time to the word of god does salvation excite you? Does the fact that you're saved and rescued and on mission still excite you? Angels long to look into these things. Peter's saying, hey, be gospel-centered. Be shaped by the gospel. Be gospel-dependent. Put your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ and allow it to transform your life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your word. It is reliable. It's trustworthy. Right now, we want to put our faith in you. 
if you've not put your faith in Christ yet and you want to do that right now in this moment, if you want to become a Christ follower, if you want to receive his salvation, I'd love to pray with you. You, you, you pray this prayer in your own heart. I'll, I'll lead you in a prayer right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for dying in my place for my sins. And I know that I have sinned against you. And in your own heart, you just maybe, whatever the Holy Spirit brings to your mind, whatever you need to say sorry for, you, you just do that right now. Please forgive me for my sins, Lord. Cleanse me. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for taking the penalty that should have been mine. Thank you for the cross. I receive your forgiveness now. I follow you as my Savior. And I bow the knee before you as my Lord. Gladly and willingly. In Jesus' name. I pray for every person that said that prayer right now. I want to pray that... Lord Jesus, you would flood them with your Holy Spirit. Bless them that they would know how wide and deep is the love of God for them and that they would build their lives on the sure foundation, the rock, which is your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Great, what a great Sunday we've had together. Thanks, Ryan. That was just amazing. We never tire of hearing about God's salvation work towards us, about God's redemption. And this, this this morning is just so encouraging. It should motivate us with the week ahead. It should encourage us as we move forward from here, as we say, as we say thank you to Jesus for dying, for saving us, and for giving us a hope in the future. I hope you've enjoyed being with us. I hope you've given us a bit of a shout out. If you are joining us for the first time, do get to our website, make yourself known to us. We'd love to be in touch. Maybe book to come and uh, and be with us in person next week. If you're joining from around the world, it's been such a privilege to host you this morning. Don't forget of our appeals for Vit Coppen Primary and Vit Coppen Clinic uh, that we've got coming up. Our Christmas, uh, December services that we've got to look forward to. We hope to see you again soon, either in person or back here at nine o'clock next Sunday morning online as we worship and enjoy God together. Thanks so much. Have yourself a great Sunday.